Hello everyone, welcome to the last module of Hydrography 2. Today we are going to talk about data analysis method as we have talked about the types of oceanographic data that we could observe from the field mostly to support hydrographic measurements and we have also talked about how we can observe them, what type of parameters that we are looking for and today we are going to process all this data into a very very informative type of presentation. So the key point here is to make those data into information. Okay, so before that, we are going to talk about the content of today's lecture. Uh, the first one, we're going to talk a little bit about the ocean atmosphere interaction, which is going to be quite uh, an interesting general knowledge for all of you guys. And we haven't really talked about it in our previous modules. The second one is going to be about statistical analysis. I'm sure that you are quite familiar with this because you have talked about statistic quite a lot um, in adjustment computation, probably last year. And then uh, the third one is going to be spatial analysis. I'm quite sure that you're familiar with this as well because you have talked about it in you know, interpolations. Um, I believe you have talked about cross profiles, stuff like that. Basically geographical type of um, data presentation. And then the fourth one is going to be quite interesting because it's going to be quite new for you. As in oceanographic measurements, we always deal with um, time uh, dimension, okay? So we, instead of uh, plotting the data into like an X, Y type of thing, like geographical kind of stuff, we actually take into account the time. So for example, we put the time into our X axis. And then the last one is going to be about data presentation. So before we actually understand about the ocean atmosphere interaction, we need to understand what is happening between our solid earth and our atmosphere. So if you remember, we've got an atmosphere that is basically a blanket to our earth. Why do I call it blanket? Because all the heat that we actually um, sense in the solid earth is not directly coming from the sun, okay, from, from the heat source. It is actually coming from the atmosphere. So basically the atmosphere is acting as um, a filter, okay? And some of this heat is going to be reflected back to the atmosphere. And then at some point it will go back again to the earth, etc. So that is, what is called the estimate of the heat budget for the Earth. And of course, when we are talking about budget, we can imagine that, okay, in a financial budget, a healthy budget is when uh, the income is balanced with the outcome, okay? So that's what our Earth is trying to do originally, okay? We're not talking about global, um, global warming or like climate change, but basically, our earth in its original form is always trying to make an equilibrium, okay? So we have talked about the income and like the outcome budget of the heat. We can talk about something that is called the convection current in the atmosphere. So what is actually convection current? So we are going to go to the UK for now, maybe at least where I studied. And imagine that we're going to the UK in February, which is very, very cold. So you can imagine that uh, the air is cold outside and we need to stay inside and we need to turn on our heater or our radiator. So this is our room. You've got hot radiator, which will make or which will heat um, the air surrounding it to be hotter, will be warmer. And because it's warmer, it has less density, so it needs to rise. But of course we've got our ceiling, okay? Our ceiling, makes the air um, need to find a place to go because it cannot uh, rise further. So it goes on uh, to a cold window because uh, you know it's, it's a closed window, but um, it's very, very cold outside. So the window is going to be the coldest part in your room. So that air is going to cool down. And then because it cools down, it has more density and it will fall. Then it goes back again to the hot radiator. It will heat it again, and then it will rise again, etc. And then you've got a warmer room. That's basically the physical concept of the heat uh, in the Earth. So if we move this concept into our geographical uh, form, you've got an area which is the hottest in the um, equator, of course, because it's the closest to the sun. And then 
it will rise up to a place where it is the coldest, which is uh, the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole. And then it will go back again to the hottest part and then it go up again and etc. But something is missing from this concept, uh, which is called the Coriolis effect, okay? I hope you remember this and you understand this well. So in Coriolis, uh, because our Earth is spinning, um, Yep, so that's counterclockwise. So everything that is, even, even like the air, is going to be deflected. Uh, at the north, it's going to be deflected to the right. And at the south, it's going to be deflected to the left. So at some point, instead of like, um, instead of continuing up here, your, um, your track is going to be deflected back and it will fall down somewhere in our earth. It goes back again, and then it gets deflected again, etc. The same at the pole, because it's falling in here, instead of going down all the way to the equator, it will actually deflect up, and then goes back again, and etc. Now you've got two cells. What is happening in the middle? So in the middle, because the air is falling in here, it will travel and then it will go up again in here, basically. So it's basically just an effect of falling and the rising in these places. So these three guys are called cells, okay? So that's what you actually see in the global air circulation. Why is it important? Because of this global air circulation, you always have something that is going on like this, right? So there's always air going up in the equator and there's always air going down at around 30 degrees. So this air, so we're talking about wind, yeah? This will cause something that is called trade winds, okay? This trade wind is the one that generated something that is called, uh, it's, it's basically like the biggest current. So that is um, the current that is used by sailors to, for example, going uh, from, from the east to the west. So it's easier for you if you want to sail um, with, you know, if you want to use the wind from the east to the west, if you are at this part, okay? And then, um, above 30 degrees, you will have something that is called westerlies. So westerlies, why, why does it look like that, but it's called westerlies? It's because when we're talking about wind, we are talking about where it came from, okay? So when we're talking about wind, again, we're talking about where it came from, but when we're talking about current, for example, we're talking about where it goes, okay? So that's why it is called westerlies, because west is there, okay? And then this is called easterlies because it's coming from the east. Okay, so we understand about the global air circulation. What about the local one? So if we try to see in a coastal region uh, this type of convection, this is actually what happens. So in you know in in daylight, you will have warmer land but cooler sea. That's why you've got a flow that looks like this. So this is going to go up the air and then it will cool down at the sea. So this is what is called um, angin laut, okay? Uh, that is uh, what we have talked about maybe in elementary school. That is what makes um, the sailors or um, fishers, fishermen uh, go back uh, at daylight. But at night, it's the other way around. So actually the land is cooler. So it descends here and it will actually ascend at the sea. So that is why they go to the sea, uh, angin darat. Uh, they go to the sea at night. So that's about it. <laughs>